Hello Judson family and welcome to Judson at Home. My name is Zach. If you're new here, thank you for joining us today and let me be the first to welcome you. We would love to connect and get to know you and you can help us do that by visiting our website at judsonsb.org and clicking the I'm new button. Now we may not be together, but we are still unified in our love for God and for one another. As we go into a time of worshiping God together, let's remember that it's because of God's love for us that this is possible. Thank you again for joining with us this morning. Change. 
this world I will lay them at your feet and surrender every anxious thought for perfect peace your perfect peace all the loved ones I hold my hopes and dreams and all my fears I will choose to trust your name in everything in everything I will look up for there is none above you I will bow down to tell you that I need you, Jesus, Lord of all, Jesus, Lord of all. Take you at your word. Jesus, you have taken hold of me. All my life is in your hands. You are my strength. You are my strength. I will look up for the Let's all sing Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace, perfect healer, all my life, all my cares on you, King of Kings, mighty Savior, all my life, all my cares on you, Prince of Peace. 
Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for this time. Lord, we can come worship you through music. Lord, as we go into this time of listening to Pastor Keith speak your word, Lord, I would just pray that you speak to each of us in our homes and fill the rooms that we're in. Lord, we thank you for the truths that we they sing in these songs, that you are good, that you are true, that you are peace. Lord, we look to you in this time, and we love you, and we thank you for who you are. And we pray this in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Well, good morning. This is Pastor Keith welcoming all of my Judson family to Judson at Home. I imagine in my mind that the families are gathered together in the living room, that daddy's got a cup of coffee, mommy's got a cup of coffee, maybe little Sally's got a cup of orange juice or something, uh, and we're watching church together. I'm, I'm imagining right now the Kovitz family out in Beaumont watching the service now. There's Shannon, there's Jamie, there's, there's uh, Jordan, and the other people that are in the household, and and uh, that's what's happening all over our region, and all over our city. The Judson family isn't gathering in the sanctuary like we normally do, but we're gathering in our homes. And that's why we're calling it Judson at Home. I want to welcome all of you to Judson at Home and thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being faithful, even though it's digital, even though it's, you know, through video. I want to thank you for, for being faithful to church. Listen, I also want to thank you for being faithful in your giving. Uh, many of you have been so generous and so faithful. I want to encourage you to keep it up. We are in, in serious need of faithful giving, especially through this trying time of the coronavirus. So I encourage you to keep doing that. Be generous. Remember, there are three ways that you can give at Judson. One of them is to mail it in. A lot of people do that. Uh, you can uh, go online and give with your credit card or your debit card. And uh, we immediately have access to that when you do. And or you can come by on Saturdays between 10 and 12. And there's a drive through offering. And there's always a pastor and an elder there to greet you. And you can do that as well. You don't even have to get out of your car. You just drive through and drop it in the basket. But I want to thank you for the way you've given so generously to God's work. You remember it's God's work. And when you uh, get online and you give to your credit card or your bank card, you're supporting missionaries around the world. I was reading just the other day, uh, one, of the, one of our great missionaries, Bill Clemmer in Africa, a great doctor, a great surgeon, and I was uh, going back and forth uh, through Messenger with his wife, Anne, and man, they're doing a great work over there. We support them. And Lazarus Seryange in Uganda through Proclaim Africa, we support them. So remember, when you give and give generously, you're supporting not just uh, the staff here at our church, not just the programs of our church, but you're supporting things around the world that you may never see, but they're being a real blessing to the world and the gospel is being preached. So God bless you and thank you for being faithful. I really do appreciate it. You know, we're living in times where we, don't, we can't see the, the future clearly. Uh, who knows, when is a vaccine going to be invented or discovered? And uh, it, it appears from remarks that the president made last week that we may be getting back together as a church sooner than we thought we would. And I'm looking forward to that, folks. And many of you are writing me and asking me, Pastor, when are we going to get back together again? Let me tell you that the elders of our church, we're seriously discussing this matter. And the staff of the church, we're seriously discussing it. And three things will guard us, uh, will guide us, okay? Number one, uh, the fact that we believe that we are better when we're actually together. I mean, this is great, but we do believe that church is more meaningful when the church is able to actually gather together physically and geographically, when we're able to pray together and sing together and worship together and give together and hear God's word together. So we want to be together. Don't, 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 don't think we don't. We want to. And that's, that's guiding some of our thoughts, you know, that we, that, that we want to be together because we believe it's best when we are able to be together. Secondly, another thing guiding us is the, the, the fact that the Bible teaches us that we are to respect and honor the king, that we're to obey the civil authorities as much as we possibly can. And, and the Bible tells us that as much as lies within us, we should strive to live peaceably with all men. And so, my friends, listen, we are under orders from heaven 
to obey the civil authorities and not to rebel and to be on good terms for our, with our leaders, even if they're not Christians. So that's going to guide us a bit. And it was very good to hear the president talk this last week about opening up the churches so that we can attend. So the first thing that's guiding us is the fact that we do believe that we're, to, we're, we're, to, we're better when we're together. That church works better, is more meaningful, is more powerful, is more, is more what it ought to be when we're actually able to be together. A second thing guiding us is the fact that the Bible teaches us to obey the civil authorities, and we're going to be respectful and have a good testimony in our community. But a third thing that's guiding us is the sensibilities and maybe even the anxieties and fears of our neighbors. Whether, you know, what, whatever side of the argument you're on, remember a lot of people in our community are actually fearful, have a lot of anxiety. Some of them are more prone to get ill with the virus than others. And so even when we come back together again, we're going to be very wise. We're going to practice some of the basics. We're going to make sure that there's plenty of sanitizer. We're going to encourage you to wash your hands and practice social distancing. We're going to do it wisely. So those three things are guiding us right now as far as the decision to come back together again. First, let me say it again. First, uh, we believe that church is more of what it ought to be when we're actually able to be together. Secondly, we're going to honor the civil authorities and do everything we can to show respect and to obey uh, what they think we ought to do. The Bible commands us to do that. And then thirdly, we're going to be sensitive to the fears, anxieties, and concerns of our neighbors, understanding that we all don't agree about this issue. And, uh, but we want, to be, we want to be thoughtful and not arrogant or pushy about the way we go about this. So different preachers will take different positions. They have to answer to God for their position, and I have to answer to God for mine. I love you all and wouldn't want anybody here to ever get sick. Uh, and so we're going to do, we're going to make the wise decision. And when we are together, we're going to practice social distancing, uh, uh, sanitizing, and washing our hands. And we're going to be careful because we love you and we love each other and we want to be wise, and we want to have a good testimony in our community. How many say amen? All right. God bless you. If you have any questions, you're free to call the church or to write me directly through the email on our church website. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Well, that's the most I've said about announcements in quite a long time. I've just been getting on here and preaching my message. I'd like you to open your Bibles this morning to the book of Galatians, the fifth chapter and the 16th verse. This begins the section that, uh, that where the Apostle Paul talks to us about the fruits of the Spirit and the deeds of the flesh. The fruits of the Spirit, or the fruit of the Spirit, and the deeds of the flesh. We're going to read that. I want to talk to you this morning about following the leader. Following the leader. Last week I talked to you about a very fundamental part of being a Christian. Fundamental to being a Christian is humility. I said last week that the greatest character trait you'll ever develop as a Christian is the character trait of humility because it's humility that leads us to confession of sin and humbling ourselves before God. I said last week that it is impossible to be right with God without being humble. Uh, the Bible says, draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. Humble yourselves before God. And uh, the Bible says, yeah, as I just said, humble yourselves. What does that mean? It's our responsibility to humble ourselves. You know, and I was in a church situation a number of years ago where there was a conflict between some of the deacons and the senior pastor. And uh, I don't know if the senior pastor had any issues or not, but I do remember one of the deacons uh, saying in the meeting, well, it's his job to feed us and it's our job to keep him humble. And uh, boy, was there a problem in that church. No, it's not your job to keep your pastor humble. It's not your job to keep your wife humble. It's not your job to keep your husband humble. It's not your job to keep your children humble. No, it's your job to keep yourself humble. God says, humble yourself. And this is su such an important thing. You will not live a strong Christian life without humility. And all of us need to build in to their everyday lives the practice, the spiritual discipline 
of being humble and confessing our sin to God. Remember, I asked last week, when is the last time that you spent any season of a day alone before God confessing your sin? I'm telling you, friends, that is a lost discipline. When I was coming up in the Christian faith, I heard that preached all the time. I rarely hear it preached anymore, and I have to say that sometimes I haven't preached it as regularly as I should, but it is fundamental to being a Christian. If you haven't confessed any sin to God in a year, I challenge you, really, I challenge you, before the day is over, go somewhere by yourself, spend some time humbling yourself before God and making confession to Him. You, we don't go to a priest and you don't go to a pastor. That's all bogus, nowhere in the Bible. The Bible says there's one mediator between God and man. It's the man Christ Jesus. We go directly to Him. The Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I don't go to a priest because he's got his own sins to worry about. And I got mine and I go directly to the Heavenly Father and I confess my sins. This is an important spiritual discipline. How many say amen? I hope you got that last week. I'm telling you, the average Christian today spends no time as a regular discipline of life in confession of sin. And we're the worst for it, folks. It's humility. God, the Bible says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Gives grace to the humble. You don't want to be in opposition against God, you're going to lose. But we want God's grace, and we want God's help, and we want God's anointing, and that comes through humility. Amen? Now, this week, I want to give you what I think is another essential to the Christian life. It's not necessarily a trait, as I talked about last week, but it's fundamental. You know, there we got to learn the fundamentals again, folks, the fundamentals of the Christian life. And I'm telling you, the fundamentals of the Christian life will get you through. Uh... Occasionally, we might need a counselor or a psychiatrist or a psychologist. I'm not against that. But I'm telling you, the fundamentals of the Christian faith will get you through. And many of us are not practicing the fundamentals of the Christian faith and coming to the conclusion that Christianity doesn't work. No, Christianity works. Christianity is powerful. By the way, if it doesn't work, we need to get out of it. But it does work, but you have to practice the fundamentals. And as I just said, one of the fundamentals, of course, is humility. You know, when I was a little boy, my a real little boy, my father enrolled me in a basketball program on Saturday mornings called Bitty Basketball. <laughs> Can you imagine Pastor Keith, the little Bitty Basketball program? I was maybe seven or eight years of age, and my dad wanted me to learn how to play basketball. So we lived in Lowell, Indiana at the time, and he took me to a school gymnasium, and uh, and all the little boys were there to learn basketball. Now, the first thing they did was not have us play a game. They didn't have us play a game for, you know, a number of weeks. The first thing was to learn how, uh, learn the fundamentals of basketball. Like, what would you imagine would be one of the fundamentals of basketball? Well, of course, dribbling. You gotta know how to dribble. Have you ever seen somebody try to play basketball who's never dribbled the basketball before? I mean, it's pretty difficult. You gotta learn how to how to dribble. Hey, your first instinct when you start to dribble a basketball is to slap it. No, you, you dribble a basketball with your fingertips. In fact, in Chicago where I grew up, you know, we all played basketball out on the streets and in the parks. And one of the things that I was taught is if you're dribbling and your hand is dirty, you're probably not dribbling right. Your fingertips should be dirty because you're dribbling with your fingertips. That's a, that's a fundamental of basketball. Another fundamental of basketball is that you is how to pass. How to pass a basketball to another player. You gotta know how to pass the ball. There's a right way, there's a wrong way. There's one way for this situation, there's another way for another situation. Uh, another thing you learn uh, in basketball as a fundamental is how to guard the man you've been given to guard. You know, one of the things I remember the coach saying, so many times, you know, Keith, stay between your man and the basket. You never want to be trailing around along behind the guy you're guarding. You don't want to be behind him. You want to be between him and the basket. And so those are, those are little fundamentals. Now, there are more intricate and complicated, you know, things about basketball that you're going to learn later, but none of those mean anything if you don't learn the fundamentals. How do you dribble? How do you run? 
How do you move from side to side? How do you guard the man that you've been given to guard? How do you pass the basketball? And how do you shoot the ball? When I was in fifth and sixth grade, I already showed signs of growing up tall. And I would go over to a friend's house in our church and I would play basketball. Now, he was about four or five years older than me. And we would play and we would have so much fun, a, a number of us guys. And I was as tall as he was, even though he was older. But you know, I had never learned to shoot the ball from over my head. I was shooting from my hip. And I remember him, his name was Ralph. I remember Ralph stopping me and saying, Keith, if you keep shooting from your hip, any of the little guys are gonna stop you from making the shot. You gotta to learn to shoot from over your head and how to line the ball up with your elbow and the basket. And I remember the first time I tried it, I didn't even hit the basket. But I was never going to be a good basketball player unless I learned the fundamental of how to shoot the ball when I shoot it. So fundamentals are important, and it's not any different in the Christian faith. The fundamentals are going to get you through. You all remember the story of Vince Lombardi, you know, in a championship uh, game, his team lost, and I forget what team that was, but he lost. And after the game was over, here's this great football team. After the, the, the game was over and they're at their first practice after the loss of that game, Vince Lombardi, they say, lifted a football high in the air at the first practice. And then he said to the team, young men, this is a football. And what did he mean? He meant, hey, we lost, but we're going to win next year by getting back to the fundamentals. This is a football. I'm saying Christians need to get back to the fundamentals or they're never going to win this game of Christianity. You're always going to be defeated. You're always going to be going through uh, a lapse of some sort or a fall of some, short, of, of some sort. My friends, as Christians, the victory is ours. We can win the victory. I don't mean that there's not going to be uh, trouble and struggle and difficulty and that sometimes there won't be a long night of the soul. What I am saying is we can, we can live victoriously if we'll practice the fundamentals. Now, that's a lot of introduction this morning. But here's the fundamental for this morning. Are you listening? There's no way to live the Christian life without following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Impossible. You will never be the person God wants you to be without following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. You will never have the joy and strength and faith and you'll never exhibit these beautiful fruits of the Spirit without following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Now, before I read it, let me, let me lay a little foundation. First of all, when you became a Christian, God's Holy Spirit came to live inside of you. It's a wonderful thing. It's the promise of the Father from the Old Testament. That promise was given in the Old Testament, Joel chapter 2, and many other passages. Living under the new covenant, God predicted in the Old Testament that the Holy Spirit was going to come and give us the ability to live the Christian life. He would remove the stony heart, give us a new heart, and help us to follow God and obey Him. So, when you became a Christian, the Bible teaches that the Spirit of God came to live within you. Did you know that you can't even be born again? You can't really even be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. You can't become a Christian without the Holy Spirit. He's the one convicting you and convincing you before you accept Jesus as Savior. Then, when you accept Christ as Savior, it's the Holy Spirit who comes to live within you, who re-energizes your spirit and causes you to be born again or alive again. In the King James Version, the Apostle Paul said that the Spirit quickens our spirit. What does that mean? Well, without Jesus and in our sin, our spiritual self was dead. But when we accepted Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit came to live within us and never leave us. And when he did, he quickened our spirit and made us alive again. That's what it means to be born again. I've been born again spiritually. And so he came to live within me. And the Apostle Paul said in one place, 
What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit of God lives inside of me. Wow, what, a, what a, an amazing and strange thought. It's stunning and it's staggering when you really think about it. God's Holy Spirit. By the way, there's nothing spooky about this. It's just what it means is the invisible presence of God lives within me and lives within you. And we never live life alone. And wherever we go in the world and whatever we're facing, God's Spirit is there. Isn't that a, a wonderful and beautiful thing? All right, so when you accepted Christ, God's Holy Spirit came to live within you. Right now, wherever you are, God's Spirit lives within you. By the way, that makes your body, this life that you have in the flesh, it makes your body very sacred. You know, God lived in the Old Testament tabernacle, had his presence there, and that made the tabernacle and all the things there very sacred. Well, God doesn't live in a tabernacle anymore. He doesn't live in a temple made with hands. No, God now lives not in the sanctuary at our church, but God lives inside of you. The Apostle Paul said, Christ in you, the hope of glory. How is he in you? Through the Holy Spirit. He's, in, he's living in you. And what does he do? Well, he's there to help you. Jesus called him the helper or the comforter. The Greek word is parakletos, and it's referring to someone who's been called alongside you to help you carry a burden. And so Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit as our helper, our comforter, the one who's called alongside us to help us. On the night before Jesus was arrested, he was trying to encourage the disciples, and he said to them, listen, I'm not abandoning you. I'm not leaving you like an orphan. I'm going to go, but it's important that I go because it's better for you if I go. He said, you see, I'm in a body, and being in a body, I cannot be in every believer all over the world at the same time. But the Spirit, he being a spirit, can live within you. And when I go, he's going to come. And when he comes, he's not going to be with you like I have been. He's going to be in, in you, and he's never going to leave you. And while he's within you, he's going to be ministering to you. He's going to be helping you. He's going to be convicting you and teaching you and guiding you. And the idea here is, folks, you cannot live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. Now, the good news is you have him. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon all flesh. And from that point until now, every believer has not just an anointing of the Spirit, but the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said that when he comes, he's going to be in you and he's never going to leave you. That's why Jesus was able to say right before he ascended into heaven, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And then he said, and lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age or the end of the world. Well, how could he be with us? He just went to heaven. Well, he's with us and that his spirit is with us in us and will never leave us. How many say amen? Are you listening to me out there? This is basic 101 Christianity. What I'm telling you this morning isn't really deep stuff. It's stuff that it's wonderful stuff. It's beautiful stuff, but it's it's something, it's a doctrine that we forget. We forget that God has given us his spirit. His Holy Spirit lives within us and speaks to us and guides us and leads us. I know that he lives within me and that he leads me and guides me. I feel his conviction. I feel his leadership. I feel his comfort. I notice that he's leading me to remember scriptures when I need those scriptures to remind me of the truth. So I thank God for his presence. Now listen, Judson family, listen now. In you, the Holy Spirit dwells. When you go to work tomorrow, you don't go alone. God's Spirit lives within you. And he's going with you. He's going to guide you in your work. He's going to guide you in your relationships at work. He's going to help you be a better you. The best you is the you you'll be when you allow the Holy Spirit to lead you and to guide you. Did you hear what I just said? The best you. I just talking to somebody this last week who said, well, I just want to be me. And I thought in my mind, I did not correct them. It wasn't a time or place. But I thought in my mind, I don't want to be me. The, I, I've seen me. I don't want to be me. I want to be who God intends for me to be with the help of his Holy Spirit. And that's a beautiful thing. And so I encourage you this morning to think with me about how it's not just important that you let the Holy Spirit lead you. You cannot live the Christian life without the help 
and the presence and the leadership and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. If, if you don't let him lead you, you're, you're, you're just destined for weakness and defeat and trouble and unwise moves. No, we need the leadership of the Holy Spirit. How many say amen? All right, Galatians chapter 5. All of that was introduction. I won't be very long, so stay with me, okay? Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. The Apostle Paul wrote this, But I say, walk by the Spirit. Now when he says by the Spirit, that's a good phrase, and it kind of means to walk in step with the Spirit. All right? So walk, by, but I say, walk by the Spirit. If you have the King James Version, it says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit. Different prepositions, but the idea is we're to walk in step with the Spirit. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. What does he mean? Anybody walking in step with the Holy Spirit is not going to be gratifying the evil, sinful desires of their flesh. Because he's not going to lead you to do that. You're not going to be in step with him and live an ungodly, wicked, adulterous, licentious, dishonest, weak life. Because that's not the way he's going to lead you. All right, so, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And he explains, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And that's a capital S there, if you notice. And by the way, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. What an interesting passage. You know, as a believer, you have new desires, and you really want to serve God, and you really want to be honest, and you really want to love people, and you really do want to forgive, and you really do want to be gracious and merciful and kind and loyal and all these wonderful traits. You really do want to be that. These are the desires you have. Ah, but you got a war going on inside of you. The Holy Spirit came to live within you, and he has holy and good and healthy and beautiful desires. But that old flesh of yours, which has fallen and is in rebellion against God, oh, it's got a whole different world of desires and appetites. And these two are in opposition to each other, and they're opposing to each other. One translation says they are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do what you would or what you want to do. Have you noticed that about yourself, that sometimes we're just locked in a struggle and what we really want to do, we can't do because we are locked in this struggle? All right, so he goes on and says, but if you are led by the Spirit, that's what it means to walk by the Spirit, to be in step with the Spirit. But if you are led by the Spirit, verse 18, you are not under the law. He goes on to explain, now the works of the flesh, which is an opposition to the Holy Spirit, the works of the flesh are evident. Here's a list of them. If you're letting the flesh lead you, if you're going to walk in step with the flesh, this is what's going to show up in your life. This is the fruit of the flesh. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Paul's saying, listen, if you, allow, if, if you walk in step with the flesh, or in other words, if you allow your flesh to lead you, that's what your life's going to look like. And my friends, there are Christians all over the United States that are allowing the flesh to lead them, and their life looks like that. Oh, they've been born again, and they're saved, and they've made a profession of faith, but they're living in step with the flesh, and this is what their life looks like. It's filled with envy and sexual immorality and rebellion and ugliness and anger and division and strife. And my friends, that's what your life's going to look like if you're walking in step with the flesh. That's right. All right, well, listen, he goes on. But the fruit of the Spirit, listen to this. What a beautiful description of a human being. And what a beautiful description of what Jesus was like. The fruit of the Spirit, that is, if you let him lead you and guide you and you walk in step with him, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Man, what a wonderful description of a well-adjusted personality. When you allow the Holy Spirit to lead you and you walk in step with him, 
My friends, it's going to be the greatest personality transformation you have ever experienced because he's going to lead you to love with the love of God. He's going to teach you to have faith and not anxiety. He's going to teach you to, to have peace and uh, gentleness and kindness and goodness. Wouldn't you like to be that kind of person? Let me read the list again. Wouldn't you like to be a more loving person? By the way, the Greek word there is agape. So this is not just love as in passion. This is unconditional love, the kind of love that God has for me and you. Wouldn't you love to be that kind of a lover of people? Joy? Wouldn't you want to be joyful and peace and patience, and kindness, goodness, just virtue, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, able to control yourself? You see, when you're following the leadership of the Holy Spirit of your life, look, you're going to be a beautiful person. Listen, let me just put it this way. I have met people who follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit in their life. I can think of two women in my life that were probably the two greatest blessings to me outside my mother uh, ever. One whose name was Betty Huff and the other is Estelle Ware. These two women lived in step with the Holy Spirit and they had the most beautiful personalities. I have known men, I remember a man named Don Wheeler who had a great influence on me when I was a young evangelist. What a great man he was and he walked in step with the Holy Spirit. And if it's appropriate to say it, he was a beautiful man. There was something compelling and beautiful and inspiring about him, but it didn't come through uh, asserting himself. It came through the fact that he walked in step with the Holy Spirit. How many know what I'm talking about? That's right. So he goes on to say, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, that is, if we live in step with the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Or let me let me correct what I just said. He's saying, he's saying, if we live by the Spirit, that is, if we've been born again, if we're alive spiritually because of the Holy Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit, or let us also walk in step with the Spirit, being led by Him and in step with Him. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, or envying one another. What, a, what an amazing passage of Scripture. In a nutshell, are you listening? In a nutshell, the Apostle Paul is saying, do you want a beautiful life? Do you want a life filled with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness? Do you, you want to be that kind of a person? Well, the way you become that kind of a person is by allowing the Holy Spirit to lead you. He is leading you. He is there, prodding you, speaking to you, convicting you, helping you, consoling you. Walk in step with the Holy Spirit and see what happens to your personality. Walk in step with the Holy Spirit and see what begins to happen in your ministry. Walk in step with the Holy Spirit, married couple, and see what begins to happen in your marriage. Walk in step with the Holy Spirit, teenager, and see what begins to emerge in your life that's beautiful. Look, the modern teenager in America is filled with anxiety. Do you want to live that way? Listen, friends. You start walking in step with the Holy Spirit, letting him lead you and guide you, young person. I'm telling you, there's going to come a peace in your life that is so different than so many of your peers. You're going to live a life not filled with anxiety, but a life filled with peace and gentleness and kindness and goodness. So the Apostle Paul puts it this way. There are two passions in your life trying to lead you. One is the passion of the Holy Spirit. One is the fallen passions of your flesh. As a believer, you have these two in opposition to each other in your one person inside of you. You really want to do good. Remember the Apostle Paul? I mean, the Lord Jesus said to Peter, Peter, the spirit indeed, the, the flesh indeed is the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You remember that? Sorry, I got it jumbled up. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Yeah, that's the way it is. The spirit wants to but the flesh is weak. They're in opposition to, to each other. Okay, so here's the question. Which one are you going to let lead you? Which one are you going to allow to lead you? They're both trying. The Holy Spirit wants to lead you because he wants to lead you to the beautiful life of the fruit of the Spirit. 
love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, all those good things. He wants to lead you because the Holy Spirit knows all of the heartache and the trouble and the difficulty and the mayhem and the damage that is created by the deeds of the flesh. Who are you going to let lead you? This week, when you go to work, who's leading you? Remember, Jesus said, my sheep will hear my voice. How are we going to hear his voice? The Holy Spirit leading us. I want to encourage you today. I want you to encourage you not only to humble yourself and con confess your sin and to begin a discipline and practice of confessing your sin, I want to challenge you. Sometime today, to have a conversation with God and say to him, I am so sorry that I have ignored your spirit in my life. I want you to lead me and guide me and direct me. And I yield myself to you today. Now you're going to need to, see, to say that today. By the way, you're going to need to say it tomorrow too. A Christian lives with the ever-present consciousness that without the leading and help of the Holy Spirit, we are doomed to failure and defeat. This is what Jesus meant when he said, without me, you can't do anything. Well, what does he mean? He's, he went to heaven. What do you mean without me? Listen, you have his spirit, the spirit of Christ dwelling within you. Without him, you can't do anything. I want to challenge you this morning. Yield yourself to him, the Holy Spirit. This is the fundamental of the Christian faith. I hope you will. Now, let me just say a word to anybody who might be with us today who has not yet accepted Christ as Savior. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit today, and my friends, he's the one that speaks to our heart. He convicts us of our sin. He convinces us that Jesus is our Savior and that he died on the cross for our sins. Maybe you're listening today and you have never accepted Jesus as your Savior. I want to encourage you right now, right where you are, to listen to the prodding and the voice of the Holy Spirit and accept Christ as your Savior. Put your faith and trust in Him. Maybe you've heard this many times and you've always said no or later. No, today, follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Take the first step of a Christian Follow the leadership of, a Holy, of the Holy Spirit and put your faith and trust in Jesus. I hope you will. What's going to happen? You're going to be born again. God's Spirit's going to come and live inside of you, and you're going to come alive spiritually. The Holy Spirit will never leave you. He's going to help you with every problem that you ever face. When you accept Christ as Savior, all your sins are going to be forgiven, past, present, and future, all of it forgiven, washed away like it never happened. Your eternal destiny is going to be changed. You were on your way to hell, and now you're going to be on your way to heaven. I want to encourage you right here, right now, to accept Christ as Savior. And if you want to, there's a button on your screen, the raise a hand button. You can push that button, and people on our staff are watching, and they would love to help you accept Jesus as your Savior right now. Will you do that? I hope you will. Let me say a word of prayer for everyone today. Dear Heavenly Father, Help us to remember this fundamental. We cannot live the Christian life without the help of the Holy Spirit. Help us to remember this. And help us to act on it. Help us to live aware of the fact that there is a war going on inside of us. There's a struggle. The Holy Spirit and the flesh. Who's going to lead our lives? Help us to answer that question with a resounding declaration. The Holy Spirit is going to lead our lives. This is New Testament Christianity. In the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments led the people, and they failed. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit leads the people. Help us to follow him and yield to him. Walk in step with him and let him lead us. And Lord, I pray for anybody out there hearing my voice that has not accepted your son Jesus I pray that they would accept him right now. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you.
little longer this morning. I hope you forgive me. But God bless you. I love you. Looking forward to being with you together at the church facility. Stay tuned for some announcements I think are sure to come and soon to come. All right? God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Follow the Holy Spirit. Thanks again for joining us this morning. As a friendly reminder, we have three different ways of giving. The first way to give is to drop off your tithe at the church. We'll have the back parking lot open from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. on Saturday. You would come up into the parking lot, drive up to one of the lovely volunteers, and drop off your tithe. Quick, easy, and contact free. The second way of giving is through our website at judsonsb.org by clicking the Give button. The third and final way of giving is by sending your tithe via mail to the church. I hope that you all have a wonderful week and leave today with your heart and mind transformed and renewed. Remember that you can always connect with us at the church through our Facebook page, Judson Church. Or if you have any prayer requests, please connect with us through our Facebook group, Judson Care. Until we can meet face to face again, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. Have a wonderful Sunday.